So let's review what we covered in this unit. In this unit, I introduced the idea of power laws. And to do so, we thought back to box counting from the previous unit. So the basic equation from box counting was this. The number of boxes depends on the side s. And we saw that if this equation is true, it manifests itself as um, a line on a log log plot. And if this equation is true, it means there's some self-similarity or scaling that occurs. So then the starting point, more or less, was to reverse this logic. If we see linear behavior on a log log plot, then we suspect that there must be self-similarity of some sort. And we took this functional form, and I just wrote it in a different way, slightly, well, not even a more general way, just a different way, and said, I call this a power law. It's x raised to some exponent. So it's the variables downstairs raised to a power, and then some constant out here. Then the example that I used to start us off was considering word frequencies in the novel Moby Dick. So what we did is determine the frequencies of all words. How often does the word whale appear, or the, or sea, or ocean, or blue? And then we get a whole lot of frequencies. Every word has a frequency associated with it. And we plot a histogram of those frequencies. And if we do that, here's what we see. We see that there are a lot of words, almost half the words, that appear exactly once. And then the frequency of words tails off very quickly. It turns out that there are 18,000, almost 19,000 different words that appear in Moby Dick. Um, there's one word that appears over 14,000 times, and then there are 9,000 words that appear only once. So we're describing uh, something, in this case frequencies, that has a really wide range um, from 1 to 14,000. And that's a very uh, somewhat unusual situation compared to, say, the heights of trees or the heights of people or the masses of books where there's a pretty tight range. So if we took this and we plotted it on a log-log plot, we see a region of, of rather linear behavior. And so that suggests to us that um, we would see power law behavior. So then I took a step back and said, well, let me, I want to contrast power laws with other types of distributions that we see. And the most famous distribution, and one that's very different from power law, is the normal distribution. It's also known as the Gaussian distribution or sometimes a bell curve. Here's the formula for it. And here are um, a bunch of different normal distributions plotted for different sigmas, for different standard deviations. So the standard deviation is a measure of how spread out it is. And so this one, which is very peaked and narrow, is, has a small standard deviation, and this shape widens out as sigma, the standard deviation, gets larger. So I um, have the normal distribution. It has a very strong central tendency. They're, they're clustered, and there tends to be a relatively small range of outcomes that we see compared, say, to the word frequencies that go from 1 to 14,000. Okay, so um, a key, um, why is the normal distribution so important? Well, it turns out there's a good reason to expect to see it all the time, as we do, and that, is, uh, that reason is given by the central limit theorem. So here's what this says. Suppose we have a set of random variables, x1, x2, x3. Then I could add up those random variables, and I'll, that sum, that big number, would itself be a random variable. How would that sum be distributed? Well, it says that that's going to be normally distributed as n gets reasonably large, regardless of the distribution of the variables themselves. So the example we did was a contrived example where books come in only three different masses. Definitely, that's not a normal distribution. But if we add up a bunch of books, we get a normal distribution. So that, and that's an example of the central limit theorem. That regardless of the distribution, well, provided that the um, variance is finite, we're going to see um, a normal distribution out of this. So the intuition to take away from this is that normal distributions, we would expect them to be common. Any variable we see that is itself um, the result of a number of additive influences, a bunch of things that add together to produce a certain outcome, we would typically expect that to be normal. Then another type of distribution that I looked at was the exponential, or sometimes called a geometric distribution. 
in this example was imagining um, uh, how long you would have to wait for me to successfully crumple up a piece of paper. Oh, I missed. Um, and throw it in my uh, recycling bin. So sometimes I miss a lot of times in a row and it takes many, many trials. More often I, I get it pretty quickly. And so um, this is an exponential distribution, so-called because the variable is up in the exponent. There are also a large um, range of values, but large values become very unlikely very quickly. And I'll show, say more about that in a second. So these are very common um, waiting times between events that happen with a constant probability. Here the event is I throw something into the recycling bin, happens. I have a constant probability of being successful. Um, and lots of other distributions, in fact, including the normal distribution, are exponential for large x. So exponential is an important, uh, important distribution. All right, so back to power laws. Some of the features of power laws, one of the important features, is that power laws have long tails. And what that means is that they decay much more slowly than exponentials. That yes, large values of x, whatever that may be, word frequency or so on, are small, but um, they're not exponentially small. So here are two plots. The power law is the solid line, exponential is the dotted line. And this shows that in this range, it looks like they both decay and it looks like they're both zero by the time we get to 15. But that's not really the case. If we look from 100 to 200, the exponential now is indistinguishable from zero. But the power law is small, 0. 0.00005, but not impossibly small. Here's another way to see this. Um, for the two functions we looked at in this unit, exponential, what's the probability we get x equals 50? Very, very small, something you'd probably never see in your lifetime. What's the probability you'll get x equals 50 with a power law? This is small, but not unthinkable. If we were to sample a couple hundred thousand times, we'll see things like this, or, or larger still. So this behavior is, is referred to as a long tail. Power laws have a long tail. Extreme events are unlikely, but not that unlikely. Another interesting feature of power laws is that they're scale-free. They look the same at all scales. So if you rescale a power law, you get a power law. Here is the power law from x equals 1 to 10. And we see that as x gets larger, uh, the probability is smaller. Here is a power law from the same power law from 10 to 100. And we see that as x gets larger, the probability gets smaller in just the same way as it did from here. So this is an example of self-similarity. Now, not all distributions are scale-free. Exponentials are a nice. Um, Counterexample. So here is an exponential from 1 to 10, and the outcome gets less likely as x gets larger. And the same story is true here, but they, these curves don't look the same. So the sort of decrease in likelihood is not the same across all scales. Here's a numerical way to see the same thing. Suppose we're looking at a power law and we want uh, of this form, and I want to know. How much more likely are events of size x than events of size 2x? Remember, as x gets larger, um, things are less likely. So we'd expect more of these than of those. Well, I can plug in, in the formula, do a little bit of arithmetic and algebra, and I get 4. And the key thing is that this ratio of th this number 4 doesn't depend on x. It's the same no matter what x is. There's no x in here. For the exponential distribution, the story is different. Uh, if I have something described by this distribution, and I again want to know how much more likely is something of size x than size 2x, if I do the math out, I get this answer. And the key thing to note is that it depends on x. So this ratio is not scale-free, independent of x, independent of scale. It depends on the scale. So that's another way of seeing that exponential functions are not scale-free. So a few mathematical notes. One can show that power laws, in fact, are the only distribution that is scale-free. So that if you see scaling behavior like this, you know you have to have a power law. 
And also, I mentioned briefly that discrete and continuous probability distributions are different mathematical things. And if you're working with them, trying to get numbers out of them, you need to handle them differently and interpret them differently. However, from 20,000 feet, which is where we'll operate for most of this course, um, by, and by that I mean uh, trying to take a sort of more conceptual big picture, the difference between these two types of distributions is usually not crucial. So we can talk about long tails and the intuition we get from that without really having to worry about whether or not we're talking about discrete or continuous. If you want to actually get numbers out of stuff, then one needs to be a little more careful. Okay, so then the last set of things we talked about was power laws and averages. And it turns out that power laws sometimes don't possess average properties, which seems like a weird thing, and so I try to motivate this with a couple of examples. So first, a non-power law example. If we toss a coin, some sort of game, and you get a dollar if it's heads, zero if it's tails, your average winnings in this game would very quickly approach uh, a half. So here I'm imagining playing it a thousand times, here's the average, and it's almost exactly a half. And the fluctuations about the average get smaller. In contrast, the St. Petersburg game is, a, is um, rather different. So here you keep tossing a coin until you get heads, and you win 2 to the x, where x is the number of tosses it took. So rarely you get very large payoffs, and most of the time you get small payoffs, like 2 or 4 or 8. And it turns out, we saw, that the average winnings in this case does not exist. It's infinite. And here are some plots showing that. Here I'm plotting uh, the average as a function of the number of trials, and number of data points. And the average is jumping around. That's from 1 to 20. Here's from 1 to 100. It grows, still jumping around. Maybe it's settling down, but nope, it keeps jumping. Here's out to 100, 000, or 10,000. As you plot more and more data points, it never, it's not approaching any value. It keeps jumping up, slipping down, jumping up, and slipping down. And we showed mathematically that the average does not exist. It turns out, in a sense, to be infinite. It grows without bound. So that's kind of weird. And then I said, turns out that power laws uh, have a similar property. It depends on alpha. So if alpha is less than or equal to 2, the average does not exist. And if it's less than 3, the standard deviation does not exist. So there's this interesting middle region, we looked at alpha equals 2.5, where the average exists just fine. So here I'm plotting on the left, I'm plotting the average out to uh, 1,000 trials. And we can see that it's approaching 3. And you can show mathematically that the average is 3 as well. Um, and if I plot it out to 10 or 100,000, this curve wiggles a little bit, but it gets smoother and smoother approaching 3. The standard deviation, which is a measure of how much on average it fluctuates about the mean, um, shows that same jumpy, spiky behavior that we saw with the St. Petersburg game. Here I plotted out to 10,000. I could keep plotting and keep plotting. I'll continue to see these large jumps. So the mean looks like it's a sort of safe, well-defined thing, but the standard deviation, the spread about the mean, turns out to be infinite. And that looks like a duplicate slide. Sorry about that. Here we go. So. Um, Grand summary for power laws so far, they have long tails, they're self-similar, and sometimes averages or standard deviations don't exist. So um, I think the takeaway from this is that this is different from most distributions we're used to, normal distributions and exponential distributions in some time. Diverging averages and standard deviations mean we need to handle these with caution, and um, they have some rather unusual and I think interesting and fun mathematical properties. So this brings us to the end of Unit 4. This unit was on power laws and some of their mathematical properties. The next unit will be on empirical power laws. We'll look at processes that are, um, to varying degrees, well approximated by power law distributions. We'll look at a number of different examples, and we'll talk about the important issue of how to do data analysis with power laws, and how to tell if your system really is a power law or something else. So we'll see you next week.